Hi everyone, I'm David Chadwick. I'm the founding pastor of Moments of Hope Church. Welcome to Moments of Hope Church Online. It's a privilege to bring to you each week worship, the word, prayer, and what's going on in the life and ministry of Moments of Hope Church. We're at Hope Farm right now. You can just see the beauty of this place and how we're beginning to understand how to use these 125 plus acres that the Lord has given us. Interestingly, during a pandemic, the Lord blessed us with his great favor and we're so excited to be out here this past week we had our first toe in the water with kids camps and we had an amazing successful kids camp over a hundred people here it was just amazing and astonishing the folks who helped lead that lead of flowers and kate otto two of our leaders in our family and kids ministry lita tell us about what happened hey everybody we had our very first hope farms day camps this week at our beautiful Hope Farm. We have been dreaming of this time that we could bring kids and teens together to worship the Lord and to have fun and to make friends with each other. We walk the trails in the woods. By the way, we have new trails in our woods. They are beautiful. They played in the creek. They walked through the fields. They looked for treasure, which was awesome. Up in the barn, we had crafts. We had story time. We sang and worshiped the Lord. It was just a wonderful day. They even played games with Miss Kate. She is so good at creating games for us. And I'll let her tell you what they learned. So our theme was God's Great Adventure. And they learned that knowing Jesus makes every day an adventure. And the verse that we focused on was Joshua 1, 9. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And the best part about the camps is our counselors were our teens, and it gave them the opportunity to love on our littles, being first grade all the way up to sixth grade. And they got to look up and see the older kids love Jesus and talk about their life with Jesus, and that made it the best. You know, a couple things come to mind here. One is every study that's been done that suggests why kids who are brought up in the church remain in the church when they go off to college and remain in the faith, obviously, as well, is one thing. And that is when seniors in high school and also high schoolers generally mentor middle schoolers and middle schoolers then mentor younger kids and that is the one key thing that keeps kids involved in the church and in the faith for years to come sounds like that's exactly what you did uh, you placed a high schooler with a middle schooler they worked together then oversaw a group of the young kids and that's the way the camp worked this week that's just astounding one other real thought that came to my mind is this is the way that we can as a church that has people spread out all over the Metrolina area when they come to worship now at Providence Day School, this is the way we can get our kids together. And in one seven-hour time period, like this time period, they got to know one, one another. Okay, didn't they? they? They really became friends, didn't they? So I'm looking forward to continuing to have ways we can use Hope Farm to be able to help disciple our kids for the Lord and to use this as a retreat place where our kids can A, get to know one another better, B, our high schoolers and middle schoolers can mentor our kids and C, most importantly, they can experience a personal relationship with the living Lord Jesus Christ, whom we are here today to worship. It is our desire to lift him up. He is worthy of all praise. Many thanks to Dan and Tiffany Anderson again and their family who are going to lead us in worship today. What an extraordinary job they do. We're so thankful to have them be a part of our Hopester family. Let us now worship the living Lord Jesus Christ.
What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other founts I know. Nothing but the blood of
strong near and bless your Hi, everyone. Uh, before I bring you the word of the Lord that he has laid on my heart as we continue this journey through the Gospel of John, and I have a message today entitled, Exposing the Devil, Exposing the Enemy, so that you can know more about who he is and his wiles to kill, steal, and destroy you. I did want to share with you a moment of thanksgiving from Marilyn and me to you uh, for your prayers for our Michael last week. Uh, our youngest son was in Omaha, Nebraska. We were there as well, uh, trying out for the United States Swimming Olympic Team. Uh, he qualified in two events, the 100 free and the 50 free. Um, he had to make the top five or six in the 100 free to be able to qualify for the team. He finished 12th and missed it by 0.4 seconds. Uh, not a lot of seconds there, is it? But that's the brutality of the sport of swimming. That is what it is. And then he qualified for the 50 free uh, made it to the final eight, and on Sunday night on NBC national television, he came out for his particular swim, and he had his big jacket over his top. And I wanted to share this with you because it was one of the most moving moments I've ever had in all of my life. Uh, he took off his coat, and there, and I think there's some pictures here, he had on his back and on his chest my 
1971 North Carolina basketball jersey. You know, North Carolina number 32, and then on the back, uh, the name Chadwick, and he uh, wore that for me, and he, he, he turned on Father's Day up into the stands and pointed toward me and waved toward me, and I waved back, and then, folks, I lost it. <laughs> I, I just lost it. I, I cried and was deeply touched by that gesture of love to me that my son gave to me on Father's Day. But what I really wanted to share with you is he posted on uh, Instagram and Twitter this week uh, those two pictures of him in the jersey, front and back, and uh, right before he took that off then to swim in the 50 free. And you have to finish in the top two to make the team on the 50 free, and he didn't, but that's okay because look at what he wrote. I just think this is a fabulous expression of his faith and how I want all of you parents out there to instill this kind of faith in your children because the truth is faith is more caught than taught. And I think Michael saw Marilyn and me live out our faith meaningfully, and he adopted that same faith as his own because he partly at least saw the reality of it in our lives. But here's what he posted. He said, this picture is worth it all. 50 years ago, my dad played basketball for the University of North Carolina. Growing up, it was my dream to play basketball at his alma mater. Well, after getting cut from my seventh grade basketball team, it was clear that my future was not in basketball. I worked hard and eventually was recruited to swim for either UNC or the University of Missouri. I chose to follow Mark Gangloff as the first recruit to, as his first recruit to Missouri. As much as I wanted to follow in my dad's footsteps, I felt called to swim for Mizzou. Fast forward to 2020, Cassie and I, that's Michael's wife, uh, felt called to start a family closer to home. What better place to move than to the University of North Carolina where Mark is now the head swimming coach. Before the 50 free, I was able to wear my dad's basketball jersey on Father's Day, my first as a father myself. Many of you know Michael had a son born about three months ago. His name is Grayson James Chadwick. Michael continues, outside of making the Olympic team, everyone comes out of the trials with a story. Praising God for one more story to include in my swimming career, Thank you to everyone for your continued prayers. The story continues. You know, folks, he wanted to make the Olympic team. That was his goal, and he didn't do it. But you know what? As I've told you so often, a disappointment is often God's appointment to something else. Now, it might be that Michael continues to swim. He's going to pray through that and try to figure it out. But he knows God's in control of his life. And he did his best, and then he gave it to the Lord. After the meet was over, Marilyn and I met with him, and here's a dad tip I want to give you one week after Father's Day. Dear parents, and especially you dads, you are your kid's father, not their coach. And I learned that especially with my other son, David, who did have great basketball skills and played at a Division I school. But I would often get in the car when he was younger and start critiquing his game because I knew the game. And then eventually I learned that, you know what, I was his dad and not his coach. So when we got in the car together after a game, I would just ask him this question, how you doing? And then just listen. So when Marilyn and I met with Michael, knowing he was a bit disappointed, I don't know a thing about swimming, so I didn't have that temptation, but I asked the question again, how are you doing? Just caring for his heart. Please, dads, moms, do that with your kids. Don't live through them. Don't yell at them and the officials at their games when you're out there in kids' parks, whatever. Just be their parents. Be their dad. And after it's all over, don't critique how they played. Just say, how you doing? Get in touch with their hearts because that will make them be stimulated to want to be everything that God wants them to be. Hey, thanks again for your prayers for Michael. They were answered. God said at this point, not now, maybe in three years in Paris. We'll see. God's in control. But remember, disappointment is God's appointment for something that he's got planned in your life. Trust him today. He's fully in control. Today's text is from John the 8th chapter. We're going to begin with verse 39 and go through verse 48. Uh, it's a powerful text and we're going to unmask the enemy. We're going to expose the devil and how he works his wiles so that we can defeat him. The context again, as John so expertly did last week exposing the verses beforehand, Jesus is basically saying, 
that if you follow him and abide in him and his words abide in you, you will be set free. And then he goes on to say that the one whom the Son has set free is free indeed. And then he goes on to say as well in verse 37, I know that you are offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because my word finds no place in you. And we know since John the fifth chapter that these religious officials began to plot the demise and killing of Jesus himself. So he says basically that the freedom we experience in Christ is basically because we have a new identity in him. That if we love Jesus, no longer are we servants under an evil master who wants to punish us. We don't have to worry about breaking the law and God punishing us. That's the attitude of a servant. We're now adopted sons and daughters in the family of God. And when that happens, we have a new identity and we're heirs of everything the father owns. In that day, if a father didn't like his son, he would literally choose a slave whom he did like and eventually adopt him into his family. And that slave took on the father's name and had every heirship of everything the father owned. It was an extraordinary gift to a servant who became a son. And that's what Jesus is saying here. If you realize your new identity in him is as a son or a daughter and not as a servant constantly worrying about being punished, you are set free free because you know the love of the Father is so extraordinary. You know that you can't ever out His grace. You know that nothing can ever separate you from the love of the Father. It is a freeing encounter as indeed. So that is the debate Jesus is having with these Jewish officials right now. And after he gives this teaching about being now a son, not a servant, and being free in him, here's how they answered him. Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, If you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works Abraham did. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. So Jesus' word is the truth of God. He'd heard it from the Father himself. He spoke it to them. It is encapsulated in this book. This is our truth. Dear friends, that's how Jesus responded. And this is not what Abraham did. You are doing the works your father did. They said to him, we were not born of sexual immorality. We have one father, even God. Well, let's stop there for a second. Uh, Jesus is basically saying, I am telling you the truth. This is everything the father has told me. They said, our father is Abraham. Jesus said, look, Abraham did not behave as you behaved. Abraham was a deep man of faith. In fact, in Genesis 11, when God said, leave your hometown of Ur of the Chaldees in present day Persia and go to a land that I'll show you that will belong to you, Abraham just left in total faith and obedience to God. Then he entered into a covenant with God in Genesis 12. And God promised that he would have a seed one day. And that seed would be through whom God would bless all the nations of the earth. Well, the beginning of that was Isaac, whom Abraham had to wait for for 25 years. He had great faith. And when God visited him in Genesis 15, 6, he said to him, it is by your faith that you are called righteous now. And in Genesis 18, when God visited him with two angels, uh, Abraham was hospitable and merciful to God when he visited him and offered anything and everything to God, whatever he wanted. And Abraham was faithful in every possible way. And here's Jesus saying, Abraham's not your father because you're not behaving like him at all. Abraham was kind, compassionate, hospitable, merciful. Whatever God told him to do, he would obey it. You're not behaving that way at all. In fact, Abraham never desired to kill anybody like you're desiring to kill me. And so they then claim, who are you to speak? You know, you're a child of sexual immorality. They were taking a huge dig at Jesus. The rumors still were probably floating around that Joseph was not Jesus' real father. There was somebody else out there who was Jesus' real father. He was a child born of sexual immorality. And they said, we have one father, even God. They were talking about the monotheism that they did have, but not believing in a triune God, one God in three persons. And that's how Jesus responds when they made this claim about having one father, even God. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you'd love me. If God were your father, you would love me, for I came from God, and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. Here's another reference to the fact that there's one God in three persons, 
Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Jesus said, if you really love God, you'd love me because you would know that I came from the Father. My Father sent me into the world. Interestingly, he says, not of my own accord. For the whole idea of saving the world from its sin and keeping us from going to hell was the Father's idea. And he went to the Son and said, would you go? Would you enter into that world as a human being and live the perfect life they can't live and go to the cross and die taking the punishment for their sin upon yourself so that I can adopt them into my family, no longer than being servants, but being sons and daughters in my new family, being an heir of everything that I own. And the son willingly submitted his equality with the Father in the Godhead to come save us from our sins, to rescue us from going to hell. Jesus said, I didn't do this on my own accord. I did it because the Father asked me to. And if you really knew God the Father, you would know that I am the Son and that He sent me into this world. Why do you not understand what I say? It is because you cannot bear to hear my word. It's like a veil was over their eyes. It's like some of you described to me when you share the gospel with your loved ones or friends or other work associates. It's like a veil is over the, their eyes. They just simply cannot see what God wants them to see, who Jesus really is. You cannot bear to hear my word. And then we enter into verse 44 which is the key verse in this passage. It is the verse that was read at the beginning of our message time together when I wanted you to understand this verse more than anyone else. It is about the evil one, the insights we need into exposing the enemy. Jesus said, You are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth. Remember Jesus said, my words are true, that I am the truth. He doesn't understand the truth at all because, Jesus said, there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. So Jesus says, you people who want to kill me, your father is the enemy, Satan, the devil. The word Satan means destroyer. Devil means the divider. That's who your father really is. The evidence of it is you want to kill me. You've just adopted his very actions himself. He was a murderer in the beginning. Interesting. And he's the father of lies. So what I want to do for the next minutes together is expose for you who Satan really is. Uh, according to the Bible, he was a created angel, a glorious angel, an angel of light. And God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit so loved one another, they created the angels for the purpose of extending that love to them. They so loved one another, they wanted to experience that love in a greater depth, so the angels were created for that purpose. And as you read the Bible, the angels love God so deeply, they worship God regularly, and they do the bidding of God as He asks them to serve us here on this planet. But at some point, before the beginning of creation, He was a murderer from the beginning. So before the beginning of this world, Satan led a rebellion against God. And according to Revelation, the 12th chapter, he was cast down from heaven and took one third of the angels with him and they became the demonic hordes. They are Satan's army, if you will. They do his bidding. So as you look at this creature, first of all, you ask the question, well, why in the world did he rebel? And Isaiah, the 14th chapter, beginning with verse 12, gives us the answer there. How are you fallen from heaven, O day star, son of the dawn? So he was a bright, beautiful, glorious angel. How you have fallen, how you are cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low, you who said in your heart, now look at these I wills, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of the assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high God. But you are brought down to Sheol to the farthest reaches of the pit. 
So why in the world did this angel, sometimes called Lucifer, this incandescent, glorious angel of light, why did he rebel against God? Because of pride. Because he wanted the position of Jesus. He did not want to be in subservience to God. He wanted to be God himself. And you see in these I wills, I wills, I wills, I wills, I wills, this desire for power and control and oversight. So he led this rebellion in heaven because of pride. Then we ask the question, well, what is his motivation? What does he want to do? What's his job description? And if you go back to John, we'll see this in a couple of few weeks. In John 10, verse 10, Jesus said, For the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy, John 10, 10, but the Son came to give life and to give it to you abundantly. So Satan came in his job description to kill, steal, and destroy. He hates God. He wanted authority over God, and when he couldn't get it, he rebelled against God, and his desire is to kill, steal, and destroy anything and everything that is of God's created order. So, after Satan rebelled, creation must have occurred because in the beginning you were a murderer. And what does that mean? Well, it means he had as his desire to murder and kill, destroy, steal from everything and anyone whom God created. To understand more fully then how Satan operates, we need to go to Genesis, the third chapter. In Genesis 1 and 2, God created the heavens and the earth, and he created everything perfectly. There was perfect harmony in all of the created order. Uh, God created perfect harmony between him and Adam and Eve, between Adam and Eve themselves, with Adam and Eve and creation, and Adam and Eve within themselves. There was perfect harmony in every possible way. So if you remember that the purpose of the enemy is to kill, steal, and destroy, he did not want that harmony to remain. He wanted, in fact, to kill Adam and Eve. Remember, he's a murderer from the beginning. Now, before we jump into Genesis 3 to look at Satan and how he operated with Adam and Eve and really the way he operates with you and me, we need to understand Genesis 2, verses 16 and 17. When God created Eden, paradise, he told Adam and Eve, you can live in this paradise. This is the place I want you to live. And before Eve was created, he said to Adam, I'm calling you to be the gardener and the guardian of this garden, of this home. You're the one I'm placing in authority over all of this. And the Lord God put Adam in this garden for the purpose of overseeing it in every way. And then God said in verse uh, 16, you may surely eat of every tree in the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in that day you eat of it you shall surely die. Now that death was a spiritual death. They'd be separated from God. No longer would they have perfect harmony with God. And secondly, they would die physically. Physical death was never God's original intent. It's an evil intrusion into God's once perfectly created world. But God said, you can eat of all of these other trees. They're all yours. But there's one tree you can't eat of that is of the knowledge of the tree of good and evil that you'll take my position. You'll be like Satan. I will, I will, I will, I will. I'm going to be God. I'll take control. I'll decide what's good and what's evil. And God said, the moment you do that, you're inviting sin into this world, and Adam, as the representative head of all of the human race, everyone thereafter will inherit that sinful nature. They'll be born with a death in their hearts toward me. They'll not seek me. Secondly, they'll be birthed with a beginning point toward death. That's going to happen if you rebel against me. So that's what God said to Adam, and then he gave him Eve thereafter, and God said to Adam and Eve, you can eat of all of these other trees, but you cannot eat of that one tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So with that as background information, let's go to Genesis chapter 3 and look at verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. Now notice that Satan, the deceiver, the liar, took on the form of a serpent. 
Now, at this point, the serpent is probably walking, may even have arms. Uh, imagine the Geico commercial with that cute little guy walking around. Looks like a snake head, but has a body with arms. And it could be that this particular animal before the fall wasn't slithering around, but was a very attractive, maybe not even a literal snake, but an apparition of one that was given to Adam and Eve. And notice that this apparition, this serpent style creature that Satan entered into in kind of an incarnation like God became one of us in Jesus. So the enemy becomes a creature that is crafty, slithering, figuring out how to come to us and get us to disobey God. Someone who studied our game films, someone who knows how we operate, someone who wants to completely kill and destroy us and has looked at our weaknesses and knows how to set traps for us. And notice that it is the field that the Lord God had made. That Lord God implies relationship, that God had a personal covenantal relationship with Adam and Eve in that garden. You're not going to see the devil ever call God the Lord God because he doesn't have that covenantal relationship with him. Notice what happens next. He goes to the woman. Have you ever asked why he didn't go to the man? He goes to the woman. Adam is there. He's just standing by passively, but he goes to the woman. And notice that God called Adam to be the gardener and the guardian in the garden. He was the one to oversee it, not the woman. When God gave that instruction to Adam, the woman wasn't even created yet. She's created from Adam's side, not from under his feet. She is an equal partner in every way, but it was Adam, to whom God had given the command to oversee the garden, yet the serpent in his craftiness went to the woman. And here is his first step in his way of attacking us, folks. Did God actually say? He tries to get us to deny that God's word is God's word. Remember how Jesus talked in John 8 about his word abiding in us, about his word being truth, about him being the truth? He came and made Eve first doubt if God's word was really true. Did God really, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, notice she says God, not Lord God, the covenantal relationship isn't there as closely and intimately. You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And notice what she does there. God never said anything about touching that tree. He just said, don't eat of it. She adds to God's word. She didn't understand the truth of what God had really commanded them to do. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. Now, now what's he doing there? He's trying to say that if you disobey God. He's a celestial killjoy. He's not trying to give you some fun times. You need to take control of the, your life. And, and you really need to know God's a liar. He's not telling you the truth that if you disobey him, you will not surely die. <laughs> it reminds me of the story of this buff biker who was out with his shotgun in the field and he saw a duck fly by and he shot the duck and the duck fell to the ground. And he went to go collect his duck and there was this kind of frumpy farmer who walked up and as the biker leaned over to pick up the duck, the farmer said to him, that's my duck. And the guy said, no, this is my duck. I shot the duck out of the air. And the farmer said, nope, duck landed on my ground. It's my duck. The farmer said, don't touch that duck. Well, the biker said, no, it's my duck. I shot the duck. I own the duck. I'm going to get the duck. And the farmer said, no, it's my duck landing on my ground. You can't have the duck. And the biker said, yes, I can. The farmer said, no, you can't. And so the biker said, hey, I got a deal here for you. Here's what we'll do. You can hit me as hard as you want to, and then I'll hit you as hard as I want to. And the one who hits harder is the one who gets the duck. Well, the biker's real buff and he's big and strong and he knows he's going to knock the farmer for a loop. And the farmer's, again, this kind of weak, frumpy guy. And, you know, he doesn't think that he's got much of a wallop, the biker does. And he goes, the farmer goes, okay, that's fine with me. And so the farmer says, I'll go first. And he lays back and wallops the biker as strong as he can. The biker knees buckle. He falls to the ground, shakes his head like this and goes, wow, that was quite a wallop. So he gets back up, and right before he's beginning to strike the farmer, the farmer goes, ah, 
take the duck and walks away. <laughs> but that's what the evil one does. The evil one just wants to wallop you. He, he wants you to think that there are no consequences if you sin. And that was what Satan's trying to do here. There are no consequences if you deny the truth and live life on your own terms. You'll not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to her eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate and she also gave some of it to her husband who was with her and he ate. Folks, when that happened, as God promised, if you eat of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will surely die. At that point, death was introduced into Eve and to Adam. And since we are again in Adam's representative headship, all death was guaranteed to you and me as well. So when Jesus in John 8 calls Satan a murderer from the beginning, from the beginning of creation, right when the Garden of Eden was created and Adam and Eve were placed in it, when he came and tempted in his crafty ways, misstating the Word of God, making it seem like God's a celestial killjoy, inviting them to decide what's good and what's evil, then at that moment sin entered the world and death entered Adam and Eve and death entered you and me. Satan's first murder was of Adam and Eve and you and me. Death is in this world because Satan is a murderer. He was from the beginning. And then moreover, if you go to Genesis 4, just the next chapter, you have Cain and Abel, and Cain kills his brother Abel, the first murder that's mentioned in the Bible from the beginning. Satan is a murderer. That's what he wants to do, folks. John 10.10 10 is his job description. He wants to kill, steal, and destroy. And he wants to do that with you. He wants to convince you that you can be as God that you can take control of your life and be as God, that you can determine what's right and wrong, what's good and evil, you will be as God. And what he doesn't tell you when you make that decision to sleep with that guy when you know you shouldn't and then the consequences are revealed later on, or you start taking that drug that you know you shouldn't drink, uh, take, but then later on you become addicted to it, when later you have to experience the consequences of your rebellion against God and against His truth, Satan cackles with delight because all he wants to do is for you to die and he wants to steal from you your life and destroy every part of who you are. He was a murderer from the beginning and he operates by just telling us lies to try to keep us from the truth of God's Word. And when we live in those lies, and when we start to determine what's good and what's evil, when we start calling good evil and evil good, when we start calling light darkness and darkness light, we are inviting a continued rebellion in this world for darkness to continue to cover this world. And we have this world being ruled by Satan, the father of lies, the king of the kingdom of darkness, and we are his minions, and the demonic world has access to us to continue the call to kill, steal, and destroy. That's what the enemy wants to do. And in Proverbs 14, 12, there's this interesting verse that says, there's a way that seems right to man, but ends in death. It seems right, we think so, because we've determined above God's rule and his word what's right and what's wrong, but it really is a pathway that leads to death. In Romans chapter 1, Paul is addressing the Roman culture, which is very much like the American culture, one where they believed that they controlled everything, that power was in their hands, they would determine what's right and wrong, they had a resistance to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Paul writes in Romans 1.18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness, catch this folks, suppress the truth. Today, in our culture, we are living in such a way that we are suppressing the truth. We are coming after the Word of God and saying it's not true anymore. We're saying we know better and we can decide what's right 
and what's wrong. And folks, we do that to our own demise and to our culture's troubles and problems. I would invite all of you today to realize Jesus is trying to teach us that He is the way, the truth, and the life. And when we live by His rules and by His ways, we have life and we have it in abundance. That's Jesus' job description, to give us life and to give it to us abundantly. So look at verse 46. Jesus asks, which one of you convicts me of sin? You know, try to find sin in Jesus. You can't because He is the perfect, pure God-man, the Lamb of God who went to the cross to die for the forgiveness of our sins. He has to be perfect in order to die for our sins. Who convicts me of sin? And of course, they could not find any sin in Him. If I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? Whoever is of God hears the words of God. The reason why you do not hear them is that you're not of God. So as I looked at this passage, I concluded that in this debate in our culture today about binary and what's non-binary, whether there are two truths that should guide us, we need to go to God's Word and find what He says to us. Dear friends, Jesus made it clear that there are two fathers in the universe. There's the Father in heaven or the Father of lies. Which one is your father? Who's your daddy? Is it the Father of the universe who's revealed Himself to us through Jesus Christ our Lord or the Father of lies? You know, there are two roads in Matthew 7. There's a wide road that leads to destruction, and Jesus said many are those who are walking on it. He said there's also a narrow road, and those who believe in Him are walking on that narrow road. Yes, He has set limits for us. He's told us how to live. He's told us how we should live our lives sexually, emotionally, psychologically, without pride, in humility, in serving others. His road is narrow. It's a difficult road. It's a disciplined road. But you know what? The disciplined person is the freest person of all. Why? Because we can say no to lies. We know those lies. We can say yes to the truth and keep walking toward Jesus. Jesus also said there are only two gates. One is very wide. It is a road. It's a gate that leads to destruction. It's the gate that says, whatever you want to believe is all right and ultimately you'll be okay. But that wide gate leads to destruction. Jesus said on His narrow road, there's a narrow gate. And He is that gate. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except by Him. There are two religions in the world. They're basically the religions of works or the religion of grace. The religion of works is the wide road where you think if you just work hard enough, you'll get God's approval. But the narrow road is the one that says you can never work hard enough to receive God's approval. It's a free gift given to you by grace. One road is wide, works. Just keep trying harder enough in order to have that works righteousness. But the narrow road says you can't ever do enough. It's Jesus who gives you eternal life. Walk on that road. It is the road of grace. And when you know it, you know you're a son and a daughter of the King of kings and Lord of lords, and you are loved so greatly. One of those roads is the correct road, either grace or works. We Christians believe that Jesus gave us grace and forgave us of our sins on that cross forever and ever. There are two kingdoms, only two kingdoms. There is this visible, temporal kingdom that we live in now. There's also an eternal, invisible kingdom. This kingdom is a kingdom of darkness. Jesus said that Satan is the prince of this world, but there's a kingdom of the, the kingdom of light and Jesus is the light of the world, and He is king of that kingdom. Which kingdom rules your life? Jesus said there are two citizenships. Do you have a citizenship only of this world? Do you think this world is all that there is? Jesus said there's another citizenship. We're citizens of His kingdom in His eternal reality. He also said that there are two kinds of children in God's family. You're either a slave or a son or daughter. Which are you? Do you still see yourself trying to earn God's approval? If so, you are a slave. And you'll have to worry about being punished by the master whenever you fail him. But if you're a son or a daughter, you know how much you're loved by him. You're either of the creator or you are of the creature. What does that mean? It's what Paul was trying to say in Romans 1. Either God is your creator and you've not suppressed the truth and you want his truth, you want to know his ways, or you have made yourself God. You have said, I'm going to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and I'll decide what's right or wrong. Is that you today? You either have feelings determine your truth, or you have God's Word determine your truth. 
Folks, it's that simple. You know, when you believe that God's Word is the eternal truth, you look to that for truth today. If you have feelings determine your truth and you're all over the place, constantly letting your feelings say this is what's right or wrong and you'll never have any real satisfaction. Let me draw this to a conclusion as we look at today and some of what's going on today. If you believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and that His words are true, you need to know that there are two genders. That's what God's Word says, male and female, not hundreds. Somebody estimated there are 631 different genders. It's not true. There are two genders. That's what God's Word says. It's also the idea that there is a marriage between a man and a woman. That's God's original intent. That's what He said in His Word, and if it's true, we go to His Word to guide our lives. We also believe that there are two governments in this world. The best kind of government is a republic that gives people freedom of religion, or the other opportunity is a Marxist government, which says the government controls everything and becomes your God itself. One of those two is true. Uh, there are also two economic capabilities. We either have capitalism guiding us, which is free enterprise and allows us to be free to seek everything that we want in this world, or we have a socialist kind of government, which is really just another word for economic oversight of our lives, and the government controls our economy, which is it. We have in our world either two worldviews, either Christ is Lord of this world or chaos is controlling this world. It's one of the two. Either Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and He controls everything, or the world is in chaos. There's no control whatsoever. And by the way, for those of you, and we're going to honor you in some weeks to come, those of you graduating from high school, as you go off to college and you have professors all the time teaching you that there is no God, that there's no one in control of the universe, your only other option then is chaos, and ask your professors this question. Well, if it's chaos, how did all of that begin? How did it begin? Causality is a great question you can ask your professors as you're on campus because you know what? They don't know how all of this began. They have no explanation for it either. We believe God began it. Where there's design, there's got to be a designer. If you really push them to causality, how did something come from nothing? Where did it all begin? They really don't have an answer. They'll go to quantum physics and some other different explanations. But if you push them even in the physics area, how did it all begin? They don't have an answer. They are relying on this world's creation by something by faith. And so you can go there to believe that Christ created this world and we don't have to live in chaos because we know the one who created this world controls this world and we are His. So you have either a world that's guided by Christ or chaos. And folks, if you are a slave living under the master of this world's chaos, if you're guided by the flesh and your passions and your desires, you don't have to stay there. You can be guided by the Holy Spirit. What Jesus came to do was to give us truth inside our hearts, to give us the word that will guide us into all truth. And here's what I believe with all of my heart. If you are a slave and you're impassioned by the desires of the enemy, if you have been captive to him and you know his desire is to kill, steal, or destroy your life, you can be set free. How? By inviting Jesus into your heart. When Jesus enters your heart, you become a son or a daughter of the King of kings and Lord of lords. The Holy Spirit enters you. The third person of the Godhead, the literal power of God enters you. And then he'll begin in Romans 8, 29 language to conform you to the image of Jesus. He'll start making your desires his desires. And you will no longer live a life controlled by your passions and your feelings and your desires. You will live a life that is solely committed to him, that wants to live for him. You'll have as your master passion to do the will of the Father who created you as a son and a daughter. I believe with all of my heart Jesus is the answer to every single one of the issues that face us today. And when you invite him into your heart and his power consumes you, you'll start to become the gender he created you to be. You'll start having a marriage that he created you to have. You'll start being the person that he desires you to be. It is his power in you that conforms you to his image and makes you into his truth-bearing, image-bearing child of the Father in heaven. Oh, I pray that you will come to understand that. You'll not fall prey to the lyings of Satan. You'll not let him destroy your life. You'll live for Jesus and let him control you in every possible way. When you do, you'll be set free and you'll become a son and a daughter indeed. To Jesus alone and always belongs all of the glory. It's in his name I ask this. Amen. Please, please pray with me. 
Father, if there's anyone out there right now who wants to invite Jesus into their hearts and have him control every part of who they are, I pray they would do so right now. And I pray they would release all of their passions and desires to be under the one true living God. And when they do so, they are set free and free indeed. Thank you, Lord, for giving us Jesus, for giving us the truth on how to live. We now defeat the wiles of the enemy today. We no longer want him to lie to us and control us. We want Jesus to control us inwardly, powerfully, in every possible way. We love you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for entering hearts right now. I feel it happening, even right now. And I pray if anyone is receiving you right now, they'll let us know so that we can begin to help you be conformed to the image of Christ and to understand what the Word of God teaches so that you can follow it faithfully. It's in Jesus' wonderful name I ask this. Amen. We love each week to give a gift to a partner who's doing a work for Jesus either locally or globally. One of those partners is Global Catalytic. Uh, they have an incredible ministry in the nation of Iran right now. People seeing dreams and visions of Jesus. I want you to hear the work that they're doing right now. Please watch this. Hey friends, I'd love to share with you an update from Global Catalytic Ministries and the underground church. God is moving in amazing ways right now in the Middle East. God is making a mess in the countries that we're in and we're just the cleanup crew. What I mean by that is that Jesus is showing up in dreams and visions and power encounters. People are coming to Christ by the thousands. Mosques are being emptied. Entire cities are being turned upside down. Entire nations are being impacted right now with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Disciples are being made and churches are being planted. You know, right now we have over 750 churches that we've planted in eight countries across the Middle East. And these are countries where it's not only dangerous to become a follower of Jesus, but it's punishable by death in some instances. You know, one of the things that we do in order to pour into our persecuted leaders and our underground church pastors is we host conferences outside of the countries and we go to places where it's a little bit more safe to be able to meet and gather. And so we'll bring in several hundred pastors and for two weeks we will just pour into them and bring teaching and encouragement. There was one particular conference there was a young lady that had become a follower of Jesus and was leading a movement in her city. And we were all standing in the conference hall and we were worshiping together. And she raised her hand and wanted to share. And what she said just completely marked me. She shared that as she is gathered in this conference hall, that it was the first time in her life that she was able to be in a public place singing loudly in a corporate setting with other believers. And she shared with, the, with all of us in the room with tears streaming down her face. She said, today, a lifelong dream has been fulfilled. Friends, the opportunity that you and I have to stand with the underground church is one of the most important things that I, I believe we can do with our time, with our effort, and with our money. Remember that piece that Jesus said when he said, when I was naked, you clothed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me a drink. When I was hungry, you fed me. And when I was in prison, you visited me. And they said to him, Jesus, when did we do these things? And he said, when you did this to the least, you did it unto me. So friends, when you stand with the underground church, you're standing with Jesus. When you pray and support and come alongside the underground church, you're doing that unto Jesus. These are folks that are holding church meetings and Bible studies and they're making disciples not out in the open 
There aren't large Christian gatherings and churches and conferences that they can go to. They're quietly fulfilling the Great Commission in the shadows, in the secret and hidden places. So friends, thank you. Thank you for being a part of this incredible mission. Thank you for standing with the underground church. God is making a beautiful mess in these countries. And together, we're just the cleanup crew. It is my privilege to share with all of you that over the last months, we have given $50,000, five zero thousand dollars to Global Catalytic to continue their ministry, mostly in the Muslim world where people have received dreams and visions of Jesus, but just don't know where to go from there. And they're reaching them in astounding numbers. So they're one of our partners on a global level, and we are pleased to share that $50,000 with them. We want you to know where your money is going weekly, and it's a privilege to share this particular gift with you as well. If you would like to continue to support Moments of Hope Church, please go to the Giving tab. You can send us your offering through that Giving tab. We love to receive it that way. It's easy for us to receive that offering as well. But if you'd like to send us a check, please do so at Moments of Hope Church, 4500 Cameron Valley Parkway, Suite 400, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28211. It will arrive to us as well that way, and we are thankful so much for your kindness in sending us that gift. Thank you so much for joining us today on Moments of Hope Church Online. It's been our pleasure to be with you. Just remember, our goal is to make disciples who, first of all, know Jesus intimately, personally. Secondly, are growing in Him through the Word of God, in truth, becoming conformed more and more to His image. But for the third purpose to go, just go into the world and give your life away to the people and the nations of the world who so need the gospel of grace. That is our desire, to make disciples who know, grow, and go. Again, thank you for joining us this week. I appreciate all of you so much. Look forward to next week's message on the 4th of July and celebrating our great day of independence, but also our continued journey through the gospel of John. God bless you all. Talk with you all next week.